Yeah, I'd be interested in your comments uh, on uh, this very strong push we see, certainly in Australia, for equality. Equality of opportunity, no one would argue with. Equality of outcome seems to me to sound superficially attractive, but to be in fact very dangerous. It seems to me, in many ways, that's what the Marxists were after. Uh, and that if you pursue uh, equality of outcome at all costs, you actually end up limiting freedom enormously. That you're better to focus on freedom and you'll get reasonable degrees of equality of opportunity at least. We know more and more from the people who work on, uh, on human genetics that ability is not equally allocated, talent, aptitude, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, there's very little likelihood of a truly equal society occurring spontaneously. Uh, left to our own devices, uh, we are normally distributed in a kind of bell curve. And out here in the tales of the distribution are people who will do very, very well and people who will do very, very poorly. So, we don't, I think, want a society in which those outcomes are completely unfiltered by policy, uh, particularly when you consider how quickly an unequal society develops an unequal education system, which makes it harder and harder for talented people in the bottom of the distribution to get out of there. So we have to recognize the need for some kind of policy, but policy should certainly aim at an equalizing opportunity. opportunity. To equalise outcomes is possible within a democratic system if people vote to have high marginal ra rates of direct taxation. And some societies do that. Scandinavian societies are well known for having extremely high uh, taxation rates and a rather large mm. amount of distribution through that channel. The French do this too. Fine. If a democratic choice is made, to tax chief executives extremely high, high, high rates of taxation and then redistribute to people who work for them, fine. Once you cross the line beyond a democratic decision-making process into one in which equal outcomes will be achieved through coercion, then you enter the realm of, of Marxism-Leninism. You're on the road at that point to North Korea or on the road to what uh, Friedrich Hayek called serfdom the new serfdom that essentially Marxism-Leninism offered. So I think the key is to confine ourselves to what is democratically uh, viable. If parties want to run on programs of radical redistribution, let them do that. Let them put their case to the voters and we'll see which countries want to be Finland uh, and which would prefer to have lower taxation key point here is it turns out that in many cases large-scale redistribution through fiscal policy has negative economic consequences, mm -hmm. slows the growth rate, leads to distortions. The bigger the state gets, the more room there is for corruption. There are lots of reasons why even democratically selected socialism doesn't work out so well. Believe me, I lived through the experiment that Britain ran in the 1970s with policies like that. Not so long ago, and yet young people prepared to vote for Corbyn. If you it's quite real, are, if you're a millennial, mm. if you know the, the days of uh, of stagflation are as distant as as World War II is to me. It's it's very difficult to know what that was like, especially if nobody tells you. Especially if you're going hand teaching. in hand to the IMF in the 1970s. Right. I mean, that I, isn't really so very long ago. No, it's not, but it's been forgotten. Forgotten altogether. And that allows a new generation to mm. fall for the old, apparently appealing uh, offers mm. of free education, mm. uh, cancel the student loans, handouts for all, mm. and tax the rich. I mean, that stuff will always play well, provided people don't know the history know the of history. past experiments in that domain. So mm. I think here we, we should have won this argument uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, but it, it seems like you have to win it every generation mm. to be sure that the experiment doesn't get rerun. Mm. So Neil, what we're painting here is uh, the suggestion, I think, uh, that perhaps Malcolm Muggeridge had it right way back here in America in 1978, I think it was, and then 
his Blaise, Blaise Pascal lecture where he commented that the West is in danger of eating itself out from within. And you talk quite a bit about this. What is the great threat? Before we come to that question, let's just do a quick canvas of the, the sort of the bigger economic and immediate sort of external threats to, mm. uh, to the West, because they, they are certainly mounting. There's a sense in which Camelot seems to have come to an end. There, there are challenges everywhere, major economic sense. We had a debt crisis 10 years ago. We resulted with more debt. The debt's not gone away. You've said quite a bit about that yeah. lately. There's the question of open borders um, and the whole potential for Islamization and the challenges that might arise out of that for the West. The external challenges, then there's the China-America, the tensions that are emerging there. Um, and you've written again about the, uh, the way in which the newcomer is sometimes, if you like, can become a little too sure. Or that person who feels threatened will perhaps over-respond. Dangers um, from the lessons of history again. A quick canvassing of, of, of the world as you see it at the moment so that we can consider this issue. Mm. What's the biggest challenge? Our loss of faith in our own beliefs and values and culture? Uh, uh, or, or is it external? Well, I'm not sure we're even allowed to talk about Western civilization anymore. Um, they used to have a course on, on Western civilization here at Stanford that, that was outlawed long ago. Uh, when President Trump gave a speech about Western civilization, in Poland uh, last year, he was roundly denounced uh, in the liberal media. Uh, so it's become in itself a problematic concept. But let's accept that there still is something that connects, let's say, Western Europe with North America, with Australasia. Let's, let's just mm. assume that Samuel Huntington wasn't completely raving when he wrote his book, The Clash of Civilizations. What are the threats to that civilization? I think there are three. I'll take them in ascending order of importance. Number one, radical Islam. Whether you look at the Sunni or Shia branches of Islam, mm. there's clearly an ideology, you might call it a politicized religion, that targets Western civilization, that is explicitly hostile to values of individual uh, freedom, equality of the sexes, the things that have come to be quite central to our civilization. And that threat manifests itself not just in terrorism, it includes the fact that there are regimes run on the basis of that ideology that may pose a strategic threat uh, to Western countries. The second threat, uh, which I think is, is a bigger threat, is the rise of China, still run by a one-party state, and, crucially, economically more successful than any previous rival to the West much more successful than the Soviet Union, much more successful than Nazi Germany. Indeed, by some measures, China is already a larger economy than, mm. than the United States. And under Xi Jinping, overtly aiming to be at least an equal of the United States and pursuing policies, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, that have at least the look of empire about them. Thirdly, and I think the most important challenge to Western civilization is the one you alluded to, the challenge from within. Our own self-hatred or at least self-doubt, our refusal to teach uh, serious history to our, our kids, our refusal to assign the Western canon in universities, I could go on. Now, if one looks at those three th threats, the threat from Islamic extremism is most serious from the vantage point of, of Europe because there is a potential for ongoing large-scale migration from predominantly Muslim countries into Europe. And that could fundamentally alter European societies. The process is already mm. quite far advanced in some countries and in some cities in particular. The challenge for the rest of the West is, at this point, smaller, but it's imaginable that 10 or 20 years from now, there could be parts of the United States that resemble those parts of Europe that are most obviously affected today. The Chinese threat, I think, is only really problematic if we believe that a one-party state can continue to grow at around 6% per annum for mm. at least another 10 or 20 years. 
I'm not entirely convinced that it can. I think there's something deeply paradoxical about having such a centralised system run the affairs of a fifth of the human race. But that's the key issue there. Can they get to the point, not just of economic parity, but of military parity? Mm. Do they win the artificial intelligence race? If they do, then I think all bets are off, and then the West has a really major problem, a much more serious problem than the problem posed by Islamic State. But in the end, none of this really should trouble us too much, because at least on paper, our system is superior. Yeah. It's superior well, we in every conceivable in way. It offers far more mm. opportunity for human uh, self-fulfillment. It offers greater opportunities for gifted people uh, to innovate, to be original. Without free speech, how can you really have sustained intellectual advance? I mean, that's a fundamental question that I don't think the Islamists or the Chinese have a good answer to. But if we decide that we're the problem and that all the world's problems, you know, from the Middle East to the Far East, originate in the wickedness of the West, then there's a, there's a risk that we just hoist the white flag. And I see the white flag being hoisted on a fairly regular basis. Surrenders, concessions, capitulations are on a whole range of issues, both cultural and economic. So the problem is really number three. It's our decision whether Western civilization goes down the tubes or not. It's, I think, historically well equal to withstanding these challenges. We withstood the huge challenges posed uh, by Nazism uh, and by Stalinism. We, we, we withstood the challenges of fascism and communism. We ought to be able to deal with uh, an attempt to revive uh, 7th and 8th century, uh, century Islam, and we ought to be able to deal with a hybrid system which is communist in name but capitalist in much of its practice. But if we decide to throw in the towel, then it's pretty clear what the future looks like. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe, and join the conversation.